of bringing forward a budget Thank you. rather than that Christmas to have it er earlier in the year. Is there no, it's not intended to have any supplementary yep. budget in this session. Uh, I, uh, Deputy Hannigan raised this earlier on. Uh, the report is now published. It will go to the Oireachtas Committee. Uh, the uh, advisory group made recommendations about the importance of uh, universal uh, payment, but they examined issues of, um, of taxation of child benefit and a two-tier system. It will come back here to the House for discussion, and government will consider it in, in, in due course. Thank you. Deputy Troy. The process this year was announced last year that there was plans to bring it forward from December to October. I don't know whether that's... This all depends upon the European... Uh, upon the European uh, decisions in regard to the, uh, the uh, semester, as it's called. It may be, as I said earlier on, that the budget uh, for 2014 might be presented a little earlier, but I can't confirm that yet. In any event, um, we have enough uh, of challenges to deal with implementing budget 2013 before we get to considering budget 2014. Deputy McGrath. Deputy McGrath. Sorry. Can I ask the Taoiseach in relation to the Health Am Amendment Bill, which deals specifically with the funding for the HSC? Last Monday, I met a family Thanks very of much a very no, disabled we're not child Monday stuff, whose yeah. service was cut from five days yeah, down to three days. Sorry, Deputy, please, there are other I just want to ask the question. It's yeah, related to the yeah, Health we, Amendment Bill, yeah. well, when is and it also due? it's in clear breach of the Canada. Disability this, Bill. This session. And in relation to, to yeah. the young man whose service no, was cut from five days yeah. down to three days, Deputy it's a breach of the Disability Bill. Thank you very much. Deputy Troy, thank you. Thank you, Ken. Can call it. Tisha, can I ask, everyone will agree that a person's fundamental right is a right to their identity, and in light of this, Minister Fitzgerald promised to bring forward legislation in relation to an information and tracing bill. Uh, we are one of the few countries in Thanks the Western much, world who does not have this legislation. Can I ask, when will this legislation come before the House? That is under consideration, uh, Deputy Troy. Um, uh, I expect it will be published later in the year. Thank you. Deputy Boy Barrett. Uh, yes, uh, following yesterday's historic ev events, the, the, the Magdalene women uh, highlighted yesterday the issue of human rights as being critical to their whole uh, plight and their historical experience. So can I ask in that regard uh, whether the, the Taoiseach would consider moving forward as, as quickly as possible the legislation planned on human rights and the Equality Commission so that the momentum of yesterday's events can much. feed into that bill human uh, rights and ensure that we strengthen up our human rights legislation. That's being drafted at the moment, Deputy Boyd Barrett, and I expect it will, uh, it will come through in this particular session. Thank you, Deputy McGrath. Uh, Deputy Healy Ray. Thank you very much. Uh, Taoiseach, the Living uh, City Initiative is a pilot tax incentive which is to encourage yeah, people to live in city centres yeah. and to regenerate retail uh, business. Where is the initiative for people to live in rural areas and to regenerate work please. and retail in these areas? Please. It's Thank the Rights and Equality Commission Bill. The Rights and Equality. Uh, uh, I understand that for this session, this uh, session. Deputy. Thank you. Deputy you'll, also, you'll also be aware we've got another 100 million in for rural development and the MFF at the recent discussions in, in Brussels, <laughs> which I know you're pleased with. Deputy uh, Harris. Construction contracts bill, Taoiseach. Uh, when are we going to actually see the bill finalised and passed into law? And the second one is the Minister of State O'Sullivan talked about amending the residential tenancies bill. Um, do you have a time frame for when you expect the, ame the amended residential tenancies bill to be back before this? That's the second stage resumed. The other one, the first one in respect to the contractors, is that committee stage expected back in March. Deputy O'Donovan. I'm Corla, Taoiseach, two pieces of legislation. The remaining stages of the Legal Services Bill, when is it expected to conclude? And the Consumer Competition Bill, when, when will it be in the House? Legal Services and? Consumer Competition. Mm. Second one is at this session, and the um, amendments are being worked upon by the Attorney General's Office in regard to the Legal Services Bill, that committee stage. Thank you. Deputy Bannon. I'd like to ask the Taoiseach, when can we expect the uh, Human um, Tissues Bill to come before the House to uh, comply with the Thank recommendations you. of the Madden Report? And secondly, will the Air Grid Bill deal with uh, this, uh, the close proximity of wind turbines to people's homes? Well, we can't discuss the content, uh, but the Air Grid Bill and... Yeah, the, the Human the Tissues Bill tissue. is... Uh, there's no date for the publication of that bill yet, Deputy. I'll communicate with you. Deputy Hayes, you're uh, back again. The turbines are obviously uh, a matter of interest to a lot of people. There's a planning process to be gone through there, as you know. Deputy Hayes. Deputy Hayes. Um, thank you, Concola. 
just want to ask the Taoiseach there, in relation to the reported rises on diesel and petrol prices at the pumps, is there any proposed green legislation to control it? The fact of the matter is that these costs are you know, you. enormous on people with families, businesses right across the country. So just to control the, those prices... Is there promised no legislation in this area? Uh, no. To, to rise. Is the <coughs> We don't have legislation there. You could, you could raise that better, I, suppose, I assume, during the course of the finance bill going through, uh, Deputy. Thank you very much. Deputy Butler. Just ask the teacher, when is uh, proposed legislation expected on the Family Law Bill to make provisions for pension adjustments in the context of separation agreements and certain other refor reforms in family law? Thank you. The family Law Bill will be later this year, Deputy Butler. Thank you. That completes the order of business for today. Uh, we now move on to the Judicial Sentencing, uh, Sentencing Commission Bill 2012, first stage. I call on Deputy Niall Collins to move for leave, leave to introduce the bill. Thanks, uh, Count Corla. I seek leave to move the Judicial Sentencing Commission Bill 2013, which is a bill to promote uh, greater transparency and consistency in judicial sentencing whilst maintaining the independence of the judiciary. Thank you. Thank you. Is the bill being opposed? It's not opposed. I declare the motion for leave to introduce agreed. Since this is a private member's bill, second stage, uh, must understanding orders be taken in private member's time. And I'd ask the deputy to move that the second stage be taken in private member's time. I, I so move. Is that agreed? Agreed. Um, private member's bill, cemetery uh, management bill 2013. Uh, first stage, uh, deputy Eamon Maloney to move for leave to introduce the bill. I move. Thank you. Is the bill being opposed? opposed? I declare the motion for leave to introduce agreed. As previously mentioned, as this is a private member's bill, the second stage must be taken in, uh, in private member's time. And I'd ask that you move that the second stage be taken in private member's time. Uh, I move that it be that agreed? Uh, taken. Agreed. Motion re report on the uh, Committee of Procedure and Privileges on a complaint made under Standing Order 59. I call on the Minister of State of the Department of the Taoiseach, Deputy Paul Joe, to move the motion. I, I move. Let the motion be agreed. Is that agreed? Agreed. agreed. Uh, we now move on to the Finance Bill, a second stage. Deputy uh, John DC uh, is sharing his time with Deputy Tom Hayes and Patrick O'Donovan. You have ten minutes, Deputy DC. five minutes to reveal it. Okay. Uh, thanks, Les. I want to um, stick with the Living City initiative in this bill, uh, which has to do with urban regeneration of uh, Waterford and Limerick. Uh, the specifics of this are um, they're badly needed um, and will amount to real money for, in Waterford's case, a city that badly needs investment. I can't speak for, for Limerick, but the city centre of Waterford definitely needs investment and has suffered greatly and has, has changed greatly. Uh, since the economic downturn took hold. Someone told me recently that um, 150 premises are vacant in the city centre of Watford right now, 20 alone on the quay, which is, I suppose, the streetscape synonymous with the, um, with the city. Frankly, it's been, it's been devastated in the last few years. Now, there are two parts to this initiative, residential part and the retail part. I'll, um, I'll deal with the residential part first. I think it's clear the, re the Minister has recognised that many historic buildings in these two cities need to be, well, they need help if they're going to be restored. Um, many of the buildings are in um, the city centre and, and form the historical core of the city um, in Waterford. And there might be more of them um, than some people think. The difficulty is many of these buildings are not being utilised now for what they were originally intended. In Waterford, many of them are vacant of the others in the city centre Many of them are being rented, um, and they're used to, found, or to house some, some form of business, whether it's retail or service-oriented. Um, the scheme, scheme is substantial. Uh, relief can be claimed at the rate of 10% per year, um, over 10 years against income. The, you have the customary planning permission after that, certification, etc. The department has considered the fact that many of these Georgian homes are probably not pragmatic for um, families, um, so they've allowed um, or factored in allowing a building to be subdivided into smaller units. Um, the, the question is, will this measure 
make an appreciable difference to Waterford City Centre. And I, I can't speak for Limerick, but I think some helpful tweaking uh, before the commencement order is signed may be necessary. I understand that the legislation as written does allow for scope to accommodate the specific and particular circumstances or attributes that exist um, in the city. Uh, to stipulate that the house must be the principal private residence is quite a tight provision. I understand why it was written like this, but I do think, though, that over the next couple of months, some clarity needs to be given on a couple of points. Firstly, what is a Georgian building? Um, well, it depends who you ask. And if you go strictly by dates, you're probably talking about the Georgian period ending in 1830. And we need to make this provision as effective as possible. Um, some people don't count the Regency period, which occurred from 1811 to 1820. Uh, you George III, uh, who ruled until he went mad, uh, up until 1811. Um, <laughs> then he was, he was succeeded by his son, the Prince Regent, um, who was there as Prince Regent till 1820. Uh, King George, Mad King George, died in 1820, and, and his son became George IV. Um, he ruled until, I think, 1830, and he was succeeded then by his brother, who was William IV, up until 1837. Um, many regard that date as marking the end of the Georgian area. So when it comes to architecture, what is the cutoff point? Georgian style architecture kept being built well, well into the 1840s. And some would say well beyond that. Um, I think it would be important that we determine the definition of Georgian buildings and architecture in these two cities. The people who do this for a living do not believe that Georgian architecture should be strictly determined by dates. Um, and <coughs> it is accepted, I believe, in, these, in those circles that Georgian architecture um, was being built well into the 1840s. Um, if a strict definition is applied to what constitutes a Georgian building, Waterford won't benefit a great deal from this provision. So I think the dates need to be extended into the early Victorian period. Um, you know, and within a short period of time, we'll have a good idea of the footprint of Georgian and early Victorian houses um, and um, chances are a comprehensive inventory of Georgian and early Victorian houses has probably never been done before. Um, we need to find out how many there were, where they are, and what they are now being used for. I think it's important, again, that the city gets the maximum benefit from this provision. So I think it could be broadened into the early Victorian era, at the very least, to accommodate those houses that are in the style of Georgian architecture and not those who are built strictly within a certain date range. The second part to this pilot project um, assists the retail sector. You know, it's a, it's a generous provision. Um, improvements, renovations, extensions can be made, and the cost written off against income tax once the building or premises is owned and operated by the person conducting the business. As with the previous provision, it would be helpful if the minister and the department considered tweaking the provisions slightly to maximize the impact, certainly in the case of Waterford City. One point that's been raised with me already is that the number of retail outlets owned and operated by the same individuals in the center of Waterford, frankly, isn't great. Um, and that's what I've determined so far in the initial conversations I've had with people who kind of know these things. I understand that the definition of retail may be broadened to include service-oriented businesses such as a solicitor's office, a dentist's office, or a cafe. Um, and I know, and I note that um, there may be a broad definition when it comes to ref refurbishment. But it kind of leads me to believe that we have to consider loosening slightly the strict definition of owner-occupier to bring in, for example, long-term leases. Um, or if a tenant has been in situ in a particular location for a considerable period of time which would determine and suggest continuity. I think that's very important that the department starts thinking upon those lines or along those lines. I know the restraints the minister is under and the department is under, 
Now, this needs to get EU grant aid approval, and there's one thing the EU Commission won't approve, and that's the kind of investor tax reliefs introduced by the previous administration that ultimately helped destroy this economy. They made a lot of people rich in this country, but ultimately they helped ruin this country. So I think that with some discussion and thought, and I've asked people in the city of Waterford to begin thinking about these things, um, so that they might come up with some proposals that might make sense, sense to the Minister and the European Commission. Um, so I'm asking that you keep, the Minister keeps the door open on this one as well, before that commencement order is signed later on this year or early next year. Everyone I've spoken to sees the benefit and potential of this, but they just want the opportunity to make suggestions as this process develop, develops. And I have to say, I heard the Sinn Féin spokesman deal with this last night, and, and really he needs to, he actually needs to read the details of this before he actually comments on it. I thought it was unbelievable that somebody wouldn't have an even basic grasp of this before they would comment on it on the doll floor. Anyone I've spoken to in Waterford sees the benefit of this. If this works, it will have an additional impact, and that is on the, in the construction industry locally. From anyone from a painter decorator to a plumber to a highly skilled craftsman, um, you know, any of those people will see work from this. That's important in a region that has an effective rate of 20% unemployment. Um, in the city of Waterford, that's probably a lot higher and could be in the mid-30s in some areas. Um, you know, I've been banging on about Waterford in the southeast and the damage that's been done to the regional local economy for some time. This, in my mind, is tacit recognition by the government that a major problem exists and steps that are extraordinary and targeted need to be taken. And the figures back this up. And the RSI backed this up. Three weeks ago, they did an analysis called the regional dimension of the un unemployment crisis and concluded that the national level statistics hide the fact that there are areas with considerably higher unemployment rates than the average and others with considerably lower rates. Um, they said that the persistence of unemployment differentials suggest that there are underlying structural differences across regions. From a policy perspective, this is important as national policies are unlikely to address these region and location specific factors. So to the Minister and Minister Noonan in particular, Thanks for recognizing well, what the ERSI has recognized, and it's a bit more than that. Thanks for actually uh, trying to do something about it. Um, I think other ministers need to take note. When you are formulating policy, you need to consider the potential detrimental impact that a measure might have on a region that can't endure much more. Thank you. Uh, I'll finish on this. I look forward to engaging um, in a dialogue with the department and the ministers involved over the coming months and I'm hopeful he will consider some suggestions that might help make this legislation um, as effective as possible. Thank you Deputy. I now call on Deputy Tom Hayes, you have five minutes. Yeah, thank you Concola. First of all I'm very pleased to have an opportunity to speak on this finance bill. I suppose we're living in extremely difficult and tough times, tough times for everybody. And I suppose when we come to discuss the finance bill we want to discuss why we are doing certain things and why the government is um, bringing proposals before the House by way of the budget and indeed following up on the finance bill, the impact it's going to have on people. And I think the first thing I need to say is that we need to explain to the people why it's happening. I think they need to know the difficulties that they're in. And I believe that through our work here in the Dáil or through the media, that there's a, not enough effort being made to actually tell the true story of where the economy is and the trouble we've been in and how we are getting out of it. And I think there's not enough of fairness um, in telling that story. And I think everybody uh, has a duty, not alone us, but the media has a duty too, to carry that story and tell the people uh, the true uh, situation of where we are. I sat this morning and spoke to somebody on the telephone who rang my office only last week, was very irate. <coughs> when I gave 10 minutes or a quarter of an hour to talk with them, the reasons for introduction of taxes, the reason for raise, things are being, are being changed, then they understood. And the, the answer that lady had to me, why don't you tell us that more often? 
And I think the government, and I'd like to say that to the Minister of the State that's here today, that we have a responsibility to actually carry that message to our people. And I think if we're falling down on anything, we are not being open. And I would say to the opposition, too, to be fairer to us in doing things. You have to be political, I understand that, and we were over there at that side for many years. But you know, there are times when you have to put the nation first. And I think there are times that we have to, uh, in this House, to be more fair, and it would work to the betterment, not of, of, of us all, but the whole country at large. And I think it would help us get out of the mess that we're in if we were more open and more fair, rather than sh uh, shouting each other down at every given opportunity. But I would just say that that's a first start that we have to bring people with us in some of the things we're doing. In relation to the finance bill and the issues that are in it, there are many things that I would like to talk and discuss about. But one of the things I think that's of paramount importance to me is job creation. If we don't get Ireland back to work, if young people aren't stopped from immigrating, if the opportunities aren't made out there, made out there for or, or opportunities for job creation is not made. I think in this, in this budget, in this uh, finance bill, there are a lot of effort being put in um, to make job creation worthwhile. But there's still a lot of areas that I think that haven't been touched and haven't been looked at, and I certainly think that we need, as a country, to look at. And I take an example where we have over 400,000 people unemployed. If you drive any road in rural Ireland right across for the last number of months, the state of our country roads is deplorable in a lot of cases. I still, and I know every public representative in here, gets representation about roads. There is not enough people working on our roads. And I would say that some proposal in the future where you would allow some of those unemployed people to give, be allowed to keep their entitlements and to give them some extra money um, and ask them to go and help on the roads and do some work in a coordinated way with the local, with, with the lo with the local authority, that that should be a proposal that we should, um, we should look at in the future. The second thing I'd like to say, I'm sorry I didn't realise it at the time, but anyway, the second thing is the higher education grants and the proposal, a lot of discussion has taken place over the last number of months in relation to assets being, in, being calculated as an income. In my opinion, that's something that should not be allowed in. I know is it in the, this finance bill or whatever, but it's something that is unfair, it's totally unjust to anybody You can have a, a big and a large asset with no income from it. I know several cases of people I deal with that have, have those assets with their income because of what they're working at, the tradition and agriculture and, you know, small businesses. These people are struggling to survive. A lot of them are on 10 and 20,000 a year income. They are struggling. They want to put their children to college. But the reality is that if we force through an asset uh, inclusion, it will be unfair. So it's something that I would call on the government, I would call on the minister to make sure that that doesn't happen. As I say, it's unfair and unjust and uh, something uh, that cannot be allowed to continue. These people are committed to send their children to higher education and to education, so I would, they should be supported and support them every day. Thank you, Thank you, Deputy. Deputy O'Donovan. Um, I, uh, Count Corlin, I welcome the opportunity to speak. I suppose the, the finance bill, which is the third of this government, um, has been taken in the context of 400,000 people unemployed and over 80,000 people a year leaving the country and a massive level of national and personal debt. And I know the government have made um, some strides last week in relation to the promissory note, but I would just start I suppose, caution people already kind of clocking up ways of spending the saving. And it's important to bear in mind that the money that's being, that, that's potentially going to be saved from the promissory note is not new money, it's money that we won't have to borrow. And I mean, it took 14 years to wreck the country. And I think that anybody suggesting that three years into recovery, that we will go down a, a route of wreckage again, um, led by people opposite, I would really caution against that. I think one of the things that the governor of the Central Bank, and I welcome his remarks recently in the media, where he said that he was turning his attention to um, um, 
those banks that are dealing with uh, personal mortgages. I think this is hugely important and I think Allied Irish Banks in the last uh, week have made an announcement in relation to how they're hoping to um, target relief for people in distress. Um, but I, again, uh, it was raised earlier in the House, I think that um, any rumours or suggestions um, that the bank would be targeting relief while at the same time putting up uh, interest rates is something obviously I think the government would have to be mindful of and, and, and be cautious of. In relation to the bill itself, I think there are some very good aspects of it, particularly in relation to, uh, I know the Minister for State will, will welcome this as well, the R&D tax credit. There was an unrealistic, I think, high level at 75% of the time that a person had to spend in R&D and that has been reduced to 50%. For SME people, that's hugely important and I think, Minister, going forward, there may even be, especially for people under a certain threshold, there may be even opportunities to reduce that further in, in, in further provisions of, of, of future finance bills. In relation to tourism, you needn't pass through any single town in the country, but you'll find some element of tourism infrastructure, be it hotels or guest houses or whatnot. And again, the extension of the incentives to cover investments in this sector uh, will help sustain jobs and will add employment. On top of uh, what the government also did, which I think was hugely welcome, the allocation of the 7.5 per cent per litre rebate for bus, bus operators. Again, in the constituency that I represent, a rural area, hugely dependent on rural transport, be it for uh, social or educational purposes. This is hugely important because of the cost of fuels, and I know it's coming on top of the announcement that was made in the budget uh, by the Minister for Finance in relation to hauliers. And it's a, it's a clear, uh, I suppose, realistic commitment to the fact and an acknowledgement of the fact that this country is hugely reliant on road transport and the, the sustainability of that into the future against the backdrop of fuel costs has to be welcomed. Now, I previously asked in the House that those facilities that are operating in the tourism sector but also giving an educational remit, and uh, I know, Minister, this is within your own department, that, that the application of VAT to them would be something that would be looked at. For instance, if you have a pet farm or a small um, centre to which school tours are brought, a very small thing that could be done, and I know that there was a, in last year's finance bill, it was as a result of the EU Commission requesting Ireland to look at this, but I think given that there will be an educational remit for some of these facilities, there may be an opportunity to look at the application of VAT on them, and certainly the rate that's being charged. Uh, in the budget as well, changes were made to vehicle licences with the 131 uh, for this year to try and stimulate the, the, the new market. Again, the second-hand market, if you ask them, Count Corla will say to you that a simple thing could stimulate them a lot, and I've raised it in the House here before, and that's allowing cars to be re-registered, so that if you were um, Minister Sherlock and you buy a second-hand car in Limerick, rather than having to drive around it in an, in an LK, that you get the opportunity, if you want, on a voluntary basis, to re-register it, with, and, and you're proving my point, to re-register it in Cork. Uh, and, and again, it will be on a voluntary basis and there might be some revenue stream. And if you talk to any garage that deals in second-hand cars, they will say, particularly in Dublin, or Mahabut Kionkorla, particularly in Dublin, it is very difficult to sell cars with rural registration plates. And a small change like that would allow second-hand cars, especially there's a glut of them at the moment, to be sold. Um, just briefly, Count Corl, in relation to agriculture, and I've mentioned it already, I really welcome, and, I, and it was something that I had raised with the Minister for Finance and the, the Minister for Agriculture in relation to farm consolidation. I suppose the concept of the outside farm, where you have a person who's farming in area A and land comes up beside him and he has an outside farm maybe two or three miles away. To consolidate that land up to now, the, 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 the tax associated with it was prohibitive. But I think in acknowledging the fact that we're trying to get to harvest 2020, while at the same time allowing him the opportunity to extend his, um, his property, this was something along with the stock relief for young farmers and the stamp duty on transfers. These, these are tangible things that will make a big difference in rural areas and sustaining the, the, the agricultural um, community into the future. So just in conclusion, Count Corla, this finance bill has been brought again, as I say, against an awful backdrop, an awful economic backdrop. And it's a small incremental step forward. There are no gigantic leaps that are going to be made by this government to, to restoring, I suppose, um, the, the economic situation that we've inherited. But I think incrementally, uh, this is another rung in the ladder, and it's about restoring hope and restoring confidence. And I Thank think the measures, even the few that I've referred to there, will help that in some way. So I would like to support the Bill Gormagot. Thank you. Before calling on Deputy Fleming, I just want to advise the House that 23 deputies have sub submitted matters under Standing Order 27A, to topical issues, which will be listed in the official debate. The matters raised by the following deputies 
have been selected for discussion. Number one, Deputy John O'Mahony, the need to address the criminal legal aid system as currently in place. Number two, Deputy Niall Collins, the need to review mandatory sentencing in drink driving accidents causing death and the need to make leave, leaving the scene of an accident an indictable offence. Number three, Deputy Keevin O'Quailon, the need to discuss the case of a person detailed supplied diagnosed with autism. And number four, Deputy Eamon Maloney, the need for a resolution to dispute between firefighters and the Department of the Environment over, over the keeping communities uh, safe policy. Deputy um, Fleming, you have 20 minutes, sir. Thank you, Concorda, and welcome the opportunity of speaking on this Finance Bill 2013. And just so people will remember, what is the Finance Bill is putting into legal effect the measures announced by the Budget in his statement in December and part and parcel of the budgetary post of means passing of legislation here in this House, some of it by way of finance bill, some of it way, by way of special legislation for the family home tax, some of it by way of social welfare legislation. But all in all, it's, all, it's one overall package, and maybe for particular reasons, the passing of the legislation is subdivided into different areas. So, it's always important that we remember when we're talking about any aspect of the budget, um, we are talking about the overall budget in that context. So first of all, I do have to say and agree with many of the commentators who say the budget 2013 was unjust and it was regressive. And this is a policy decision of this government to make more of the adjustments by way of cutting expenditure than by increasing tax. This is a political choice of this government, I suspect. Deputy Sherlock would have been happier and the Labour Party if the balance had gone the other way but they are the small party in government, so effectively they, they can like it or lump it, and that's kind of the, the coalition government we have at the moment, and they do have to lump it in all of these situations, and as a result, we get far more cuts on people than we do on increase in taxation, which was a Fine Gael approach, and they are pushing forward with that agenda. The only surprise possibly is that Labour have been so willi willing to, to go along with it. For a second year in, the go in a row, the government has introduced a budget that is deeply regressive, both socially and economically, and it does nothing to foster economic recovery or to provide a vision and direction for the country. Um, Low-income family households have taken a wide range of hits, and the cumulative impact of the changes in the budget will have devastating impacts on and low to middle income families. The change in PRSI, for example, will hit the working poor far more than it will hit those with incomes above 100,000 euro. And you just have to ask, you know, is that fair? I don't think anybody thinks it could be fair, but perhaps it suits a particular agenda, and that's why we have these decisions here. It is economically regressive because it does not address unemployment. Unemployment is stubbornly high. Domestic demand is yet to, there will hardly be much of an increase this year. And the only reason the unemployment rates are falling is because, unfortunately, some of our brightest and best are continuing to em emigrate. And without that situation, the unemployment situation would be much higher. As I said, the Budget 2013 had a phenomenal impact on families. It contained multiple measures that will impact on families, particularly those with children and those in lower incomes. And this includes a reduction of €10 Euro a month in child benefit for the first and second child, 18 euro for the third child, and if there's a fourth child or subsequent child in the house, it will be a cut of 20 euro per month uh, for those children. Um, the budget also abolishes the PRSI allowance, which increases PRSI by 264 euro 16 cent for those working and eligible to pay PRSI contributions. It also introduced the family home tax, which has been dealt with under separate legislation. The budget also trebles the prescription charge for medical card holders to 150 and increases the monthly cap for a family to 19 euro 50 and multiply that by 12 and you'll see the impact it will have on families on low incomes and on social welfare payments and the increase in the drugs payment scheme threshold from 132 to 144 again hits people on lowest income most the abolition of the cost of education allowance of 300 euro which will affect unemployed and lone parents especially also, in addition to that, there is a cut, and people are well aware of this, of €325 Euro in the respite care grant. Um, John Burton, Minister for um, Social Protection, uh, presided over all of these. She initiated all of these. She can't blame 
Fianna Gael or she can't blame Fianna Fáil, she can't blame the trike, she can't blame anyone else. They were her choices in her budget. She chose to make those individual cuts and she decided that it was necessary to do so, all in the effort of um, um, supporting the agenda, not to ask those people who could afford to pay a little bit more to pay a little bit more. And as I said, the trust of the benefit was to cut people relying on state support rather than making people who can pay a little bit more actually do so. But when it comes to what John Burton did, and as part of this legislation, the meanest thing and the nastiest thing and the worst thing I see in this uh, finance bill from that point of view is the proposal in section 8 of the finance bill on page 8 to make maternity, to tax maternity benefit. In addition to that, I will have escaped some people that um, the minister also wants a, ta a, a tax adoptive benefit and the minister also wants a tax health and safety benefit. So we have a situation here now that we have the government for the first time ever taxing maternity benefit. I'm saying, Minister, they're going to comment about four specific sections. Some of them are okay, some of them require clarification, some of them require amendment, but this requires to be deleted. This House should not pass this legislation with this section in it to tax maternity benefits. Um, the legislation says um, maternity benefit payable after the 1st of July 2013 will be taxable on that income after. So what that means is those people who went out on maternity leave in January of this year, any payment they receive up to the end of June is not taxable. If their maternity benefit runs into July, the amount receivable and payable in July is taxable. That is a disgrace and that should not have been done. Um, I will say we will be opposing this item in the legislation and I know the Minister may talk about some transition arrangements to handle that situation but there are no transition requ arrangements required. All we require is just drop that section 8. Now, I, I thought it was a very mean act when it came in and announced on Budget Day but this week we're now knowing what, where it's coming from because we have seen over the weekend a lot of publicity and we have it, I think the reports have been published around now, the Mangan report on taxing child benefit and cutting child benefit. That report is on the Minister's desk for the last 12 months. And I believe, I believe, Minister Joan Burton clearly does want to tax child benefit. And she would have done so in the budget just gone, other than the fact that the revenue commissioners were far too busy drawing up the plan for the family home tax. I think the revenue actually made a remark on that somewhere along last year. I took all the resources to deal with the implementation and putting the system in place for the family home tax and they couldn't have taken on what would be a big logistical issue on the same period in terms of taxing child benefit. So they didn't do it, but I think the Minister will try to get her way in the next coming budget. Um, but you know something? I'd have been happy to have a proper debate on the Minister, but she didn't let go of the issue of ch taxing child benefit. She said, if I can't tax child benefit this year, well, I will start by taxing maternity benefit. So she didn't get the tax child benefit, but she's starting by taxing the children from the minute they're born. This is a forerunner to taxing child benefit. If you're taxing maternity benefit, the logic that you will follow on is the next payment that the same mother will receive from the state, she'll get her maternity benefit first, um, while she's on maternity leave, and when she starts receiving child benefit, you're already in the tax system for your child benefit, and then this, and who's going to pay the tax? This issue, the complexities of people cohabitating, people on self-assessed, separate assessments, not being taxed as a couple, married spouses, single people, who's going to pay, pay, bear the tax on this? Is it going to fall on the mother? I suspect it will, because she'll be the recipient. So here we are now seeing the forerunner um, to the taxing child benefit, the burden of it will again fall on the mother. Um, who's going to be the person probably primarily in receipt of the payment. So really, what is this tax on maternity? Is that effectively a tax on childbirth? It's anti-woman, it's anti-child, and it's anti-family. Now, some people might think it's a good idea to tax maternity benefit, and I don't agree so, and it's also anti-war. 
because it's making more, it more difficult for women to participate in the workplace, that if they do take some time out to, to have a child and have a family, that they're going to be taxed on the small amount they'll receive from the state. So, Minister, I do ask you um, to remove this section from the Finance Bill, and I'd ask the Labour Party to consider again, because this taxing maternity benefit is Minister Burton forerunner to taxing child benefit, and uh, I think that has to be stopped in its tracks as quickly as possible. Now I want to move on to section 12 of the legislation, which deals with be benefits in kind in relation to a travel pass. So really on this section, I'm just going to ask the Minister in the reply to give a bit of information as to what's involved here, because it's complicated legislation, it's talking about benefits in kind, it's talking about uh, approved transport providers, including some private bus operators. So as I understand it, if a company provides a travel pass for an employee may be required in the course of their work, and um, there is a benefit in kind implication. But I think in the interest, I don't know why it's necessary, but this legislation, Section 12, extends that um, to the civil service and Garda Siakana and the Defence Forces, this idea of benefit in kind for a travel pass. So, Minister might start by telling us, you know, how many people are in receipt of these travel passes? How many people are paying benefit in kind in respect of their travel passes? Has this applied in the public service before now? Is it a new measure or is it a clarification of the legislation in relation to benefit in kind? And also there, seem, there might be a change here about the approved transport provider. And explain to us in the course of a person's work why some employers would be providing a travel pass who pays for it and in this situation is it paid for, is it another subsidy for some of the transport companies from public bodies, from the civil service to guard? Like, I could mock, but are they, is this an arrangement now that they're closing rural regard the stations there to get the bus? And we'll give you a travel pass to get from Port Leash to Rath Downey. We'll give you a travel pass to get from Port Leash to Mount Rat. We'll give you a travel pass to get from Port Leash to Balakala. Uh, port, from Port Leash to Ballinakill, where we closed the stations, where we're cutting down the stations at night, and we're hoping that some of the bus companies will be operating during the night. We do actually have in Port Leash an hour to hour service from Port Leash to Port Harling or to Port Leash to Dublin to the airport, the air coaches. So, are the guards now expected maybe to use their travel pass and travel on these buses uh, now that the, the guard stations in the areas won't be up? I say that kind of facetiously, but I would like to know. What's behind this? How many are claiming it? What's the benefit for it? And people would be a little bit interested in catching a bit of, or shedding a bit of light on this whole area. The next thing in relation to this section is well slips in at subsection J on page 109 of the same section 12, and it talks about changing the specified rate from 4 to 5 per cent and from 13.5 to 12 per cent. The explanatory memorandum doesn't give any full details, but it just says, I think it relates to preferential loans. So I'm assuming that means people maybe in financial institutions, staff in financial institutions who had preferential loans for mortgages or purchased cars or other uh, items, and they were getting a preferential loan from their financial institution. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. And there is a benefit in charge, benefit in kind charge on that, which is correct, and there should be, as if a person is getting a loan at 4% instead of the rest of us paying an overdraft rate of 10 or 12%. There, there is a benefit from the employer to the employee, and it's correct there should be a benefit in kind um, attachment to that, and uh, we seem to be changing the rates here. But really, I would ask the Minister to clarify the situation in when you're so concluding the, this debate here, to explain how this issue of the benefit in kind and the preferential interest rate on loans held by employees in the financial services industry, many of whom are facing redundancy now, you know, as a result of the liquidation of IBRC, there will be some redundancies uh, as a result of AIB had redundancy Bank of Ireland. I think there have been about 4,000 in the banking sector redundancies have happened or will happen. Many of those people would have had loans at prefer preferential interest rate and were they all required to repay those loans because they were no longer going to employees or new loans issued to them? Was it taken out of their gratuity or lump, lump sum? And obviously the Minister has information in relation to the number of people in the various financial institutions that are in receipt of preferential loans. That information is available to the Minister because obviously people have been claiming or there has been a benefit in kind tax situation applying in those cases and what is the, um, the situation going to be in relation to people who are in so far, unfortunately so far, 
I think all the redundancies have been voluntary to date, but clearly there is a benefit in kind and tax implication for those people. So I would ask for the Minister, I'm not saying I have any problem with the legislation, that particular section, but I think we could do with a bit more information being amplified in this area. I now want to move on to section 49 of this, which deals with <coughs> um, the mineral tax rebate on auto diesel for haulage and bus operation. First of all, I welcome this provision. As I said, the last one I had no problem with. I just like information. This one, I welcome this provision, and I think it's good. And um, I think a lot of people will feel it's going to have a benefit for the transport industry and allow lots of transport companies to buy the fuel in Ireland rather than buying it when they're on the continent, perhaps at a cheaper rate. And the fuel and the revenue will be purchased here in Ireland, and the uh, Irish government will get um, taxation out of it, and there will be jobs here locally in the fuel depots where the, the, the fuel is being purchased. And it's good that the same happens for bus operators as well. And we might have a situation that, again, bus operators here will be able to get that a rebate on the auto diesel use. And that is good. It will help in some way keep their costs down. And I welcome that. And that's excellent. All I want, Minister, now, and I'm very specific on this, and it happened. I hope no are conscious of this issue. I'm looking, I believe this amendment has created an unintended consequence. And it boils down to the de definition of who is a qualified road transport operator. And again, on page 109, they talk about people who have um, <clears throat> a person who holds qualifying transport operator means a person who holds a national road hauliers operators, operators license. And it also says or if you have an EU equivalent, and the same applies to a person in the bus area who has a, a license, um, a person who holds a national road passenger transport operator's license or an international equivalent, that's fine. My issue here is people who are in the haulage business who, because of the Department of Transport legislation, do not have um, a national road haulage operator's license. And on this, Minister, um, I want you to take account and ask the Department of Finance officials to take this into account. And as I said, I do welcome the provision, but I think there was an admission here. And I want to show you here, um, refer to here, this document th um, from the Department of Transport uh, Dublin, uh, here in Dublin, and the leaflet is designed for the guidance of applicants, and it's a guide to road haulage licensing. And I turn over the first page, and there's two issues that need to be addressed in this legislation, and there are emissions, and perhaps IBEC didn't fight the case strongly enough. The first, who needs a road freight carrier's licence? And it talks about if you're doing it for a higher award, and it says, just this, the second section in this legislation says, haulage arises when you are paid for carrying someone else's goods. If you, if you only do own account work, i.e. carried your own goods in your own vehicles, driven by yourself or your employee, you do, underlined in the Department of Transport documentation, you do not need a carrier's licence. So there's a whole lot of companies out there in the transport business who do not have a, 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 a freight carrier's licence because the, the Department of Transport says because you're drawing your own goods, you do not need a licence, so they don't have one. I turn over the page and I want to deal with, there's other group of people who the department on page, the next page of this document say you're exempted from a licence. So, and these are the, it is proposed to carry any of the following commodities in this state, only a carrier, uh, a carrier licence is not required, and again under, right, two minutes, um, and that is people who ca carry cattle sheep um, milk to the creamery or cream separation stages, newly harvested wheat or oats. So really we want a situation where many of the companies in the agricultural area who have their own transport lorries carrying their own milk from farm to factory, because they haven't subcontracted it out to independent contractors, they don't have a road haulier's licence, a carrier's licence, and they can't avail of this rebate. And Minister, we want you to widen the definition of who's eligible for this to include the people, the two specific categories of people that the Department of Transport have said you don't need a road haulier's licence. And I want to give you the, the types of people I'm talking about. I think of my local quarry, Carl's Quarries in Castletown. They, they, they own their own lorries that deliver their own goods. They cannot get this fuel rebate. Whereas had they subcontracted out all the transport facilities to a transport company, the transport company can do it. So this is now, you know, I think the cement manufacturer is the same. I suspect a lot of the bakeries, a lot of people in the confectionery area who carry their own goods and own their own lorries because they don't have a, they're exempt 
are not required under this legislation to have a license, they can't get this rebate because it's confined to people with licenses. So really, we want that situation addressed whereby people, because this really, this, the, as drafted, is going to force some companies to privatise or subcontract out their transport so those companies can get, then get the incentive and the rebate, whereas they can't do it if it's their own particular work if it's, and they're carrying their own product. I think it's unintended. You know, it might make it a bit more complicated, but you can't have two people drawing out of the one quarry or the one cement factory or the one bakery. Some of them owned by the factory or the company that's running the business who's not required by law to have a licence can't get the fuel rebate and other ones who are doing it for a haulage company carrying the exact same product getting the rebate so that has to be looked at. Finally in relation to the section 29 the Living City initiative generally I support urban regeneration is good and there is a good summary of the scheme there so it's important that we do get a cost benefit you might tell me when I have a minute remaining Diana. Yeah, just over half a minute right Okay, um, it's important that when this was done before, um, that there were proper integrated area plans conducted by the local authorities, an independent advisory panel assessed which areas should be included. It's not good enough for a minister to walk up the street and I want them 40 houses included. You know, that is not the way to do business. It's also important that all of these buildings are listed buildings, so all work internally as well as externally now requires planning permission. There will be a major cost in doing the, the cost benefits analysis of this scheme then the scheme will have to be designed, the scheme will have to get EU approval, and then it will have to go through the planning process. All of which, I'm telling you, 12 months, is, it won't be, that can't be done in that EU approval and cost benefit analysis in 12 months. So what's actually happened? The priority work should have been done, the scheme then announced, such that it can move quickly. So what has happened? All the people in those areas who may have intended re, um, um, refurbishing some of those properties for commercial or residential purposes are now going to put the project on hold until it gets EU approval. So in fact you've put a stay on development in some of those houses and you've delayed development by announcing such a process at such an early stage without EU approval and some of that should have been done earlier and there should be an independent and more transparent method of identifying the locations and the cities that are to be included in this scheme. Overall, I'm happy with the scheme, it's good to regenerate urban areas, I welcome that, but we need information and clarity and a shorter time scale. I'll conclude on that. Thank you, Deputy. I now call on Deputy Anthony Lawler, uh, who I understand uh, proposes to share his time with his colleagues, uh, Deputy Anya Collins and Deputy Damien English. Uh, they have five minutes, five minutes and ten minutes, respectively. Is that agreed? That's agreed. Okay, thanks Deputy very Anthony much. Lawler. Thanks very much, uh, Constituency Deputy. Uh, here this afternoon. Uh, I must say, I first of all, welcome the bill. Um, uh, there's a lot of very positive initiatives in it, and a couple of them which I'm going to speak about is that the budget was really designed about generating jobs as much as possible. And from that perspective, and coming from a small business uh, environment, the fact that I, there are so many positive things there for small businesses is uh, very important. Uh, a couple of things I'm going to bring up, and I hope the Minister might take it on board, and it's interesting to see the Minister, Junior Minister here for um, Jobs and Innovation, the Jobs and Innovation Minister, and uh, not yourself, Deputy Hayes, um, but the Junior Minister for Jobs and Innovation, and uh, a lot of the things that are associated with this budget are around the stimulation of jobs. Uh, what I'm really going to speak about is initiatives for youth unemployment and to get our young people back at work. Uh, the sad part in this country, and where we have over uh, 400,000 people uh, claiming benefit, um, but, but little over 300,000 are full-time unemployed, a sizable proportion of that are people who are under the age of 25. Uh, the sad reflection is about 30% of people under the age of 25 are currently unemployed. And what I would like to see done, if it was possible to bring in forward amendments on, on this, would be, the first one would be, uh, there is currently a PRSI holiday for people who are long-term unemployed, for employers who take on people who are unemployed for over six months. What I would like to see, Minister, would be that something might be taken on board for those people, particularly who are under 25 years of age, that irrespective of the length of time in which they're unemployed, that there would be a PRSI holiday given to employers for taking uh, young people under the age of 25 off the door queue, whether they're on the door queue for a day, a month, 
a week or, or six months, that there would be some sort of a, a PRSI holiday given to them. Currently at the moment, you have to be unemployed for six months before you're entitled to get a PRS, uh, an employer is entitled to get a PRSI holiday. So if something like that could be taken on board uh, for particularly to, to, to work with our, our youth unemployment, uh, people who are, uh, our young people who are unemployed. Um, there is a problem for certain groups of young people in which they actually can't get themselves on the unemployment list because of the fact that if they're being tested from home and they're living at home, they're not entitled to get any unemployment benefit. So they, they're a sector, a group, which actually cannot be categorised as being unemployed, yet they are, in theory, unemployed. So, Minister, I would hope you would consider something, as I've suggested, a PRSI holiday for employers who are willing to take on people who are on a full-time basis, who are under 25 years of age, and um, and if they're not on six months on the employment list. Uh, this week we launched in the Jobs Committee a very, very good uh, policy document, which was uh, uh, creating policies that work, uh, actions to address youth and long-term unemployment. And one of the things that came out of that was, uh, during our discussions, was that a fund should be set up for young entrepreneurs uh, we have funds at the moment uh, currently for uh, female entrepreneurs. We have uh, funds available. Uh, funds are, are available for those who are getting, uh, starting up their own businesses. But there is nothing there for the young people. And I'm again particularly talking about uh, groups of people under the age 25. When you look at the, the number of young people that are involved in Young Scientists of the Year, and when you go to that show, and I'm sure you've been there, Minister, um, one of the things that stands out for me is there's a patents office. Uh, so we have young entrepreneurs with new ideas, and the patents office is there so they can sign them up straight away to make sure that their idea is for themselves, solely for themselves. But they find it extremely difficult to bring this idea to further fruition. Why? Because they cannot access funds. They cannot access funds. Um, and the reason why they can't access funds is that they have no credit history. And if there was a young entrepreneur's fund, just like there is a female entrepreneur fund, and I'm delighted to welcome so many female deputies in the chamber here this evening. Um, if there was a young entrepreneur's fund, and I know it's 250,000 for female entrepreneurs, if it was set at 750, and if the government was willing to put in 250,000, I'm sure seed capital could be generated with that 250 to generate other funds from major companies, Google, Facebook, would be surely welcome, willing to come on board to boost the fund so that we could help in some way generate um, jobs for those people who have good ideas under 25 years of age, who are stymied at the moment because they can't get any credit, credit assets. Um, one other point I just want to bring up too as well, Minister, and I, I, I've, I've highlighted the positive things with regard to jobs initiatives in the budget. There are two points I would like, hope you might consider on, is in regard to the motor industry. Motor industry has had a horrendous January. Um, they expected their car sales to have dropped, I think, about 20% on last year's car sales. And yet we put up the VRT uh, rate and the motor tax on the, the, the car industry. If there's something we can do to stimulate that, have a look at that again. Maybe if we could redress it some way or other, uh, because as I say, the motor industry, which is a huge industry in this country, uh, if in some way we could help them uh, regarding the VRT, uh, if at all possible. Again, Minister, I welcome what's in the budget. Uh, just a couple of little ideas that you might take on board and a uh, very positive uh, budget with regard to jobs. Thank you. Deputy, and I'll call on Deputy Anya Collins, who has five minutes. I note that Damien, Deputy Damien English is not uh, yet in the chamber, but perhaps, depending on circumstances, you may have more than the five minutes. Deputy. Um, the Finance Bill 2013 puts into law all the provisions of the Budget 2012. Much of the Bill merely imposes what the Dáil has already agreed to on a temporary basis, such as the fuel rebate. The Minister has announced some new measures, but the general trust of the Bill reflects announcements that had been made at pre-budget and budget stage last year. This is Minister Noonan's second Finance Bill. The bulk of the changes and the continued difficult, harsh and unpalatable measures which we have had to implement on our people 
are dictated to by agreement entered to by Fianna Fáil with the Troika as a result of Fianna Fáil's poor management of the economy. I would like to comment on some of the comments that Deputy Fleming made, particularly in relation to maternity benefit, which he seems to be extremely concerned about. Uh, under the management of Fianna Fáil, there was a particular time in this country where people who were getting full-time, who were full-time employees of the, the, the state, in, in essence, were also entitled to get their maternity benefit on top of their salary, and that was given to them tax-free. That changed about three years ago, and now we have a stage where uh, what we are introducing is that maternity benefit will be taxable. And those people who are only in receipt of maternity benefit on their own won't pay any tax because they will have a tax credit for that. So it will only affect women who are also in in receipt of other income during their time of maternity. So that might uh, help Deputy Fleming to understand that so that it is fair. Also, I'd like to remind Deputy Fleming he's so concerned about the household tax that this was another um, fee to fall measure that was brought in. And in fact, it was they who got rid of the famous household tax in 1977. Uh, and now we've had to reintroduce it and it was agreed to by them with the Trika. I know they have a slogan, wrong tax, wrong time. Uh, however, we have to deal with the issues that are in hand and that were agreed to. It has now also become apparent that while Minister Noonan was preparing this budget, he was also in deep negotiations with his colleagues in Europe to negotiate the promissory note deal. The promissory note was another fine example of poor management by Fianna Fáil. The measures implemented by this bill are another step in the right direction towards economic sovereignty. The primary objective of this government is to restore the country's independence. In order to achieve this, we have to reduce the running costs of the country. We have successfully no nego negotiated